Good afternoon, America. Welcome to the Raucous Caucus. This is Mark Levine, and I have with me... Terry Sa- D. Kester. They both talk at the same time, as usual. Terry D. Kester and Garland Nixon, welcome, welcome to a day where the sun is shining and uh, the terrorists in Boston have been caught. And I think America is a little happier today, even though it's been a really rough week. Uh, It's funny that we've gotten so much attention, and we should, on what happened in Boston. But in the meantime, a whole town in West Texas has been blown up by a uh, corporation that doesn't know how to contain its fertilizer. And some crazy man in um, apparently uh, Tennessee or Mississippi uh, sent letters with poison in it to the President of the United States and several members of the Senate. That would have been the top story if it had not been for Boston and Texas. So it's been... And not to mention, we defeated any kind of gun control law. Well, that, yeah, exactly. That. Uh, I guess maybe we'll get an offer from the Koch brothers coming to our door anytime soon. No doubt. All right, so let's... I don't know, Terry. Terry, I think we better keep an eye on Mark. The Koch brothers <laughs> might have died. Maybe we'll be flipping them a couple I mean, hundred million. Yeah. Yeah, well, know, for I mean, a couple hundred brothers. million, you know, maybe I can be bought. I mean, that's, that's a good price. A <laughs> couple hundred million? That's, that's. I don't think you want to go there, Mark. But <laughs> Anyway, um, uh, as, as, as they said uh, for, the, for the man who asked, uh, was asked whether he, uh, some stranger could sleep with his wife for, for a million dollars, or, or sleep with him, I guess, for a million dollars, whatever, and, and he said, uh, uh, well, maybe for a million, and they said, okay, we've established you're a whore. Now, now we just have to figure out what your price is. <laughs> anyway, um, anyway, anyway, we let's, started the show on a high level. We did, we did. Right. I'm in a good mood. I I feel safer for some reason, even though I don't live near Boston. Part of it, I think, is because uh, I went to school in Cambridge. I knew those places. I know MIT. I know uh, Central Square. I know Harvard Square. I know the places where at least some of these people where I have been to Watertown. Okay, I haven't spent much time in Watertown, but I I I know. I actually have a good friend of mine who ran in the Boston Marathon, and luckily for my friend uh, he was quick enough to get out in the first half of the runners uh, and he'd already left the scene by the time the bomb and the issue with the Texas blast that you that you mentioned where we had people who had voted against helping the um, northeasterners for the, uh, the the hurricane Sandy who were now yeah. saying they wanted people to vote in favor of sending them money so the, yeah, I, I think I was somewhat interested um, in the unique dynamics p- political dynamics that surrounded these inc- in- incidents. I see them as horrific, um, but you, like most people, you know, unfortunately, like something that Terry was talking about, we get kind of numbed, you know, after watching war on television and all these horror movies, and I mean horrible movies with murder and mayhem. Unfortunately, when I see those things, the true pain and suffering and violence is not as real to me as it should be because I'm used to watching, you know, Die Hard or Live Free or whatever, Die Hard and Live Free, whatever, with Tens of thousands of people getting blown up every single day. You know, you're right, uh, Garland, that there was a crazy mix of inconsistencies this week. I mean, here it is. Uh, these these two young men uh, shoot 200 rounds at police uh, through automatic weapons that I'm sure are not legal in Massachusetts. Semi-automatic weapons, I guess it I is. I think it was the police that shot 200 rounds at them. Well, uh, according to one account I read, Terry, the police ran out of ammunition. <laughs> well, then they had to shoot 200 rounds. So so maybe they yeah, shot 200 least. rounds and ran out of ammunition, but apparently they ran out of ammunition, and that's why they decided to ram the car. This was the event uh, that occurred uh, late Thursday night, early Friday morning, uh, where, the, where the older brother was killed. Apparently finished off when the younger brother drove right over him. I mean, you, you, you got to give Hollywood – I mean, I mean they, they, they actually um, – Hollywood it does, isn't as creative as reality. Uh, in in the weirdness that, that went down. Can here. I insert a, a point because this is one of the reasons that the whole thing does bother me on a on a social psychological level. I, when I was teaching at American University, teaching a film course, one of the books we used, one of the textbooks that I used, was a book, and I cannot remember the author's name, called "Life Is a Movie," and it was talking about our culture and how our culture has changed and the reality that we believe in now is what we see either on our computers on our televisions on our um, movie screens wherever and we are living i can give you a perfect example of this working at a hospital and seeing a um, 
a rapid response team going to a, an emergency situation with a patient. They act just like the people who do on TV. Six or seven people, all kinds of very loud shouting back and forth, jokes being made, smart comments being made, people standing trying to get attention. You know, it's just like you see on TV as opposed to some quiet, determined group trying to um, resuscitate somebody. It's a television so, so you think reality and they perform is, for it, and we all are caught in this movie society. You think reality is mocking TV rather than TV mocking reality? Yeah. Because I'll tell you something, this actually leads to a nice segue to, and, and there are many points we're going to discuss. We're not going to get to all of them in this hour, no? which, is, which is why uh, I, I'm actually doing the, the inside scoop. In the next two hours, we're going to go into even larger detail, uh, both on what went on in Boston, but also what went on in Texas, and the ricin attacks too, which again, I, I think are good, and, and the gun bill as well. There's, so, But uh, the thing that you're talking about in terms of reality mocking Hollywood, it strikes me that that's what happened with, with uh, Tamerlan uh, Tsarnaev, uh, the Could older, be. because this is, uh, by all accounts, a relatively normal kid. It, actually, his brother was even more normal, had many friends, was very likable, and people said really good things about him. The older brother was seen as a li- little more uh, dark. But the older brother still, he was going for a Golden Gloves boxing championship in the United States, not in Russia, because of obviously uh, Chechens are not a big fan of Russia. Uh, we're gonna, we may talk about why that is, uh, if not in this hour, in the next two hours. But a uh, relatively normal kid. Then he goes to Russia for six months, and he gets radicalized. And by the time he comes back, he has on his YouTube page uh, videos, including a video entitled Terrorists. I mean, it's amazing that someone would – where where you have people who are glorifying violence. Uh, and and how Bruce it Willis is – Bruce Willis in that? Uh, no, no. This is a oh. – a, 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 uh, um, Bruce Willby. So. An, an Al-Qaeda-type movie. I'm not sure whether it was – I think there was a Chechen separatist and, uh, and, and some music and some poetry, whatever it was. But it was – clearly he was inspired by – the brutality and, and I gotta say, look, I am I am I support Chechen independence. All right. I, I believe the Chechen people have been brutally put down by Russia. Yes. Uh no question about it. And and in really really horrible ways. At the same time, I can't justify, of course, Chechens coming back and like they did in Moscow and taking over a school and killing hundreds of, of, of I mean, killing of civilians has to stop. Uh but, but that wait, doesn't but the, wait, 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 wait. That is war strategy. Well, on both world sides. World War One, World War Two, well, created the whole point that the purpose of war is to destroy the civilians. Therefore, you destroy the enemy. Right. It is. It is uh, to uh, destroy the civilians, and ideally, the civilians will then. It's it's similar to some terrorist motives, not all, but and that is destroy the civilians, upset, frighten, horrify the civilians, and they put the pressure on their government to say we don't want this war anymore. We're suffering. In fact, isn't that what we did in, in, in you know in a large part when we started b- bombing Japan? Um, you know, and really wiping out and flattening Japan. All of that's true, and, and, I, and I don't mean to... Uh, my point about Chechnya is only to say that the situation there is complex, and I, I hardly think of the Chechens as the bad guys. I think of uh, virtually everybody there as the bad guys. My point is this. As awful a situation Chechnya is, uh, it really had nothing to do with the United States. I mean, these two young men were given... Uh, as boys, they were given uh, asylum here in the United States away from the war-torn horrors that they lived in. And it's it's very interesting to me, and I pose the question to both of you, because whatever beef they had, they had a beef with Russia. All right, I accept that. They didn't have a beef with the United States. Lots of people across the world have a beef with the United States. But Chechnya and that particular conflict, they really don't have a beef with the United States. So my question for you two is what radicalized at least the older brother? I think the younger brother was under the older brother's sway. But the older brother, what caused him to go off and become change from a relatively normal immigrant American to a killer, which is what he became? Well, first, if I can jump in, first thing, uh, the Chechnya tie-in has been overplayed. I agree. Um, you know, one of the earliest uh, interviews I heard was with some relatives, and they were in Chechnya for an extremely brief time, like not even a year, and they were just kids, so they really had no experience in Chechnya themselves. They didn't really know anything about it. The family wasn't that closely tied anymore. No, but they Chechnya. did have experience in Dagestan, which is the, the province next door where there is yeah. a lot of brutality and war and terrorism, right. so they did have their experience with some really rough, rough stuff. It just wasn't yeah. Chechnya. Yeah, yeah, okay. they did, and but you know, I, it, it's a mystery as to why they did something in the United States. You know, but I don't get it. 
I, the only thing I can get I, is that well, these I, videos I, 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 I think there's one thing that's always key to terrorism, is terrorism is, as much as I hate, you know, fear it, hate it, like any other human being, get scared to death when it happens, you know, it is a tactic. It is not something that exists outside of context. It is a tactic. And it's a tactic when basically people feel totally powerless, totally oppressed. How do you fight the establishment when you feel totally yeah, raped I don't by know it? That I'm these not justifying two boys, anything. I don't know that these two boys fit that profile. Let me get to Garland. He had a, Go ahead, Garland. Well, uh, I, I think a couple of things. I think that you can, uh, unfortunately, tie this back to state violence um, with, uh, involved, with where the Russians were involved. And I'll tell you why. Because... Um, one of the things that happened, of course, you know, you had the conflict between, we can call it a conflict flick between Russia and Chechnya. Really, it was, you know, Russia invading, attacking Chechnya, slaughtering people and blowing them to bits. Um, and they, of course, they left a lot of weapons in Chechnya and the people in Chechnya, there are arms dealers, a lot of arms dealing going on there and a lot of violence as a result of the conflict between Russia and Chechnya. I think what happens also is after that, the Chechnyan people were angry at the Russians. They were angry at this huge imperialistic government, and they saw uh, a, a, this large imperialistic government as a as an oppressor. Now, these guys they they identify with the Chechens. We as human beings can identify with any number of groups. If they identify with the Muslims, now they see any any Muslim uh, religion. They may see any. Um, country that they feel is oppressing Muslims or attacking Muslims with, through the same lens that they see the Russians, through the lens of an oppressive uh, imperialistic state. And I'm not, I'm not justifying this, saying it's good or bad, I'm just trying to deconstruct it. So I think ultimately, as a result of the Russians invading Chechnya and the violence perpetrated by the Russians, it sparked a flame where now Chechens, which, you know, are the, the Chechen organized crime, yeah, let's not forget, uh, the Chechens uh, basically, as an ethnicity, view themselves over centuries as a very as legendary warriors. Right. Um, they were involved in the uh, Beslan School Massacre. That right. was Chechens, where they uh, killed, what, 380 people died? They, hundreds. Hundreds of parents them. and children, yes. The Moscow Theater, right. that was Chechens. So the Chechens as an ethnicity, have a background of being, you know, if they feel pushed against the wall, if they feel they are not afraid to fight, and if they fight, they are a very, very, very um, vicious opponent. Yeah, but, but God, I'd, be, I'd be careful about as an ethnicity. That, that, that bothers me because, obviously, uh, there are lots of very peaceful Chechens, particularly those in the United States. I myself was incredibly impressed with the boy's uncle, uh, Ruslan right. Sarni. Who, not, Mark, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying this in a prejudicial way. I'm saying this as an example. In organized crime, which is one of the things that I, that I taught about organized crime, in organized crime in Russia, basically all the other mafias are afraid of the Chechens. The Chechen right. organized crime groups T- because they do not even respect the territory of other organized crime groups. They, they, so I say, as a historically, um, as a as as fighters, as warriors, when put in a position that they feel that they need to, um, they're at war, adversarial. The Chechen community uh, historically is a very very tough opponent. As I said, they view themselves as legendary warriors. Um, no, as a, no, as no, a, as no a, different Americans. It's no different than Americans, you know, and I think people need to realize that. We have gotten to a point where the only answer to violence is violence, and that's what we believe in as a country. That's what we believe in individuals. That's what explains the fascination we have with guns. Yes, we're purer, better, wonderful, nicer, more exceptional than anybody else in the human race, but in reality, we respond to violence with violence, and we approve of that. And I'm not saying that you didn't have to arrest these guys and corner them and everything else. I'm not saying that at all. And I'm talking, you know, again, not justifying a thing, uh, the same as Garland. But I think there are some social problems here. Nothing else. You know, here we are with this wonderful thing. We shoot these guys. We get them. We capture them. We're all that. At the same time, we can't pass a gun bill. At the same time, the United Nations tries to get through a, a gun bill on arms internationally. And who votes against it? United States of America, North Korea, and Syria. The Iran. actors of evil. Right. You know? I mean, we're, we're obsessed with violence. Well, let me, let me yeah. ask you this, because I, I think we have to be very careful when it comes to whole groups of people. One of the things I really like that both Ruslan Sarni said and, frankly, President Obama said is to be very, very careful before we, uh, we tar a whole group of people 
with the actions of these two. So these two uh, boys or young men were ethnic Chechens, to be sure. They were also Americans. Uh, one of them, I believe, was a naturalized American citizen. Yes, they had green cards. The they, was, they, yes. They'd been here since they were 10 or 11. They grew up here. They went to Cambridge Ridge in Latin School and got a scholarship. To, uh, and, uh, you know, one one guy wants to compete in the Golden Gloves, and one one kid is a good wrestler, and they've got friends, and uh, the younger one would, would uh, donate his time, like, to a Big Brother thing. I mean, these were relatively normal, good American kids. If you listen to their friends talk about them to Anderson Cooper or whomever, you see they'll say, you know, they were shocked that this could happen to them. So I, I, I don't want to, my, my, my main fear, it, it's fascinating when you, when you talk about, because most Americans have two or three or four identities. We have an identity as an American citizen. We have an identity as a religion, as a member of our ethnicity, or maybe as a sexual orientation, or maybe our gender, or maybe our age, or maybe our neighborhood, or maybe our geography, where we come from. We, we all have several identities in one, and these were boys that were very much American. They certainly had their Chechen ethnicity and their Muslim religion, although religiously, they were both very secular. Interestingly, uh, they were both secular uh, their, their entire time in America. And then just the last two, three, four years, the older brother starts to get more religious after he comes back from Russia. And by the time uh, there's also stories that, that the mother went from a very secular woman who wore high heels and bright, flashy dresses to wearing the full, uh, you know, Muslim garb from uh, Orthodox. And so they, they, they became more religious. So my, I guess my point is there's many, many different motivations and I wouldn't want to simplify it too much by saying the Chechens are fierce warriors, therefore these boys are terrorists. That, that's, I, yeah, I think you should be careful about that. We've and that to, wasn't we've what I was remember. getting at. I, you know, I mean, we can, for instance, you know, you can talk about a lot of cultures, and there are a lot of different cultures that when they, when they feel pushed or oppressed, they fight back and how they fight back. I mean, that's true of know, most cultures. Go, go no further than Afghanistan and right. look at the way they view themselves historically. That's true of most attacked. cultures. Right. I mean, the only ones you who know, don't are the Tibetan Buddhists that I know. They sit there and they're pacifists and they get destroyed. No, uh, not entirely. No, <laughs> not even the Buddhists. But the long and, yeah, the, the, the long but, and short of it is... Most you know, cultures, you know, when you're pushed against the wall, the sad thing fight is, back. You, Terry, and I can have this discussion in an abstract way and we can deconstruct this thing and we can talk about ethnicity and we can talk about culture and things like that. But as a country, I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to sound elitist, as a country, we are so... Um, ignorant when it comes to culture and when it comes to separating individuals from groups right that if you have this discussion on you know cnn or fox or whatever you've got a, a huge group of people that will that will suddenly say these are the chechens Get all the chechens fall into right this box so we might as well do x to all chechens exactly and, and i think we have to be very careful about that uh, we have to take a break uh, when we come back uh, i know that uh, terry wants to focus on some of the legal aspects specifically the decision of the fbi not to read the miranda warnings to the second suspect, uh, Johar uh, Tsarnaev, who apparently can't even talk because he's still recovering from his bullet wounds. We have a caller on the line, Michael from the Bronx. We'll get to him, and we'll also get to your calls at 202-889-9797, 202-889-9797. We'll be right back with more of the Raucous Caucus right after this. You're listening to WPWC, We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Hello, my name is Jim Gray, and I am a judge of the Superior Court in California and a former federal prosecutor in Los Angeles. I would like to talk to you for a moment about marijuana. Did you know that since the federal government first banned marijuana in 1937, usage in this country has actually gone up by about 4,000 percent? Or did you know that in the Netherlands, where adults are allowed to possess small amounts of marijuana and buy it from government-regulated businesses, fewer adults and fewer teenagers smoke marijuana than here in our country? Or that an American is arrested on marijuana charges every 38 seconds? If you are wondering if any of this makes sense, you are not alone. To find out more, contact the Marijuana Policy Project at 1-877-JOIN-MPP or visit them on the web at mpp.org. Thank you and good luck to us all. 
You're listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Welcome back to the Rockets Caucus. This is Mark Levine with Garland Nixon and Terry D. Kester. And uh, we're talking about, uh, well, what happened in Boston, but the larger implications of it, of uh, everything from Chechnya to what causes American teenagers to be radicalized to whether there's a culture of violence and guns in America to Hollywood to, well, virtually everything. And I got a caller who I know wants to comment on some of these things. Michael, I'm going to give you just a short time here during the Rockets Caucus. If you want to call back during the Inside Scoop, we'll have a lot more time. But go ahead and uh, make your point. Okay. What I find with the um, Boston bombings is it wasn't just one injustice, but a double injustice. Of course, what happened to all those poor people there, that goes without saying. But I got so upset with the way much of the media, particularly the right-wing media, has been handling the situation. They jumped the gun to calling it a terrorist act when we didn't even get official word from Boston police and the feds that this was a federal act. So I thought they were wrong on there. And on top of that, they kept saying, using the words Muslim and using the words that the suspect is dark skin color, which we now see that n- neither of that is true. Maybe the suspect in question might have had some kind of influence from a Muslim um, religious thing. We don't know that. But I thought it was totally wrong that the right-wing media once again was playing the race card and impl- implicating a dark-skinned person when, in fact, this was someone that was supposedly a naturalized citizen, that, they don't, that they're making the same mistake as they did back in the Timothy McVeigh, Oklahoma well, bombing. We'll chat about that. Thank you for your call, Michael. And feel free to call back during the inside scoop, and we'll talk about it further. So, gentlemen, let, let, let me pose to you Mike, uh, Michael's questions. Uh, first of all, uh, they were Muslim, just, just to be fair. Uh, they, they, they may have been secular, although certainly the older one definitely became more religious in his last couple of years. So that part of it was true. They certainly were not dark-skinned. I think they were uh, light-skinned or actually probably my color. Uh, they were Caucasian. The irony is that the Caucasus is not white. <laughs> it's, it's actually uh, kind of my color, sort of uh, a brownish skin. Uh, and uh, so let me ask you, gentlemen, do you think that the, the media jumped the gun and called oh, it yes. an act of terror? Go ahead. Oh, yes. Terry. Oh, yes. They always do. I mean, whatever it is. I mean, you know, b- you know, within two seconds of any event, the media not only has theme music, they have logos. <laughs> That's true. Dramatic as they can make the logo as possible. And they come out with this long drawn, serious face. They play it to the hype before we even know what's happened. And I think at, yeah, I don't know if any of you saw. I hope you did the Central Park Five that was on PBS. Mm. Uh, just last week, about, yeah. and I was in Manhattan when that happened, and I was no better than any other citizen in jumping to the conclusion that the culture and society wanted us to jump to, that there was these five boys that raped this white woman and beat her almost to the point of death, and it simply wasn't true. It was just totally totally fractured. Uh, and it, it, you made up case. It had no justification whatsoever. And there are still people on top level of government who still believe that the case was just, even though all the evidence is against it and they've been released. I'm not saying these guys are innocent. I'm not saying that at all. I, I think, think they were pretty innocent. Clear. I think they were but innocent. It, but I think the all the Central Park time, Five was innocent. No, I mean, I mean the the, the, the terror. Oh, all right, sure, yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. But but, uh, but we do immediately jump to what we want to believe, and that's scary. And well, one little small thing uh, nobody's mentioned that I even only found out today. You know, Tamerlan, you know, was married to right, a woman named Catherine Russell, and that's has right. a child. That's right. I mean, there's tragedy that just all of, all of this is tragedy there isn't anything beautiful about it it's just tragedy uh, garland uh, let me ask you do you think the media jumped the gun even before the the fbi came out with the pictures which i guess was a couple days ago uh i i mean dark skinned or muslim uh or a terrorist i i'm just wondering how much you think the media did that or how much of that was sort of social media and people out outside the media what do you think garland I, I i think realistically i don't think it was jumping the gun saying it was the, it was it was a terrorist act I do think that, um, interestingly, the Ryson um, letters, even though the guy was mentally ill, had he been Muslim, had he been Muslim, 
the, 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 it would have shortly been um, been called a terrorist. Attack. It was a terrorist so, act. I don't. You said poison to the president of the United uh, States. That's a terrorist act. I don't know how you not call it a terrorist act. The right. right. Of, but if you notice in the media, there's that's not played much as a terrorist. But you know, I don't really think it, uh, they jumped the gun. Now, don't get me wrong. Terrorism does sell, and they've got their banners all prepared to you know go put across the street screen. But when I saw it. Um, it had all of the makings of, you know, the evidence was there that it was a terrorist attack. So, I mean, realistically, if I were running the network and they said, what do you want to do? I'd say, let's go with, it appears to be a terrorist attack on the United States. Well, what because about, what just, about Michael's other up. point, that, uh, that they were said to be dark-skinned? Did you hear that? Because I'm not, I'm not sure I heard that, but I, I want to be fair to Michael. Did, did either of you hear? They turned out not to be dark skinned, or at least the way we think of dark skinned, unless unless my coloring is dark skinned, which I guess might be. But uh, uh, you know, did did you hear yeah, I that? Heard, I, I heard that reference. I heard that reference. Okay. I can't yeah, pinpoint I, where, but I heard it. Garland, did you hear that reference? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, unfortunately, Mark, uh, in, in the uh, in, in, in uh, any time there's crime in America, the uh, the, the, the suspects <laughs> are dark skinned. The suspects always seem to be dark skinned. The Rising guy was not dark skinned, for the record. He was a white guy, but uh, uh, or is or whatever. But um, I, I mean, it, it's look. I I wondered. I'm not going to deny it. I wondered when the attack occurred if it could be. Uh, some kind of radical Islamic terrorist because, let's face it, there's a lot of radical Islamic terrorists out there. That doesn't mean by any stretch that all Muslims what? are terrorists. 99.9% are peaceful. But it does well, mean some, that some, most, some. If, not, if most Muslims are not terrorists, it, I, on the flip side, however, you could say that most terrorists today, they're more likely to be Muslim than another religion. I think that's a fact, even though that's an unfortunate one. So it did cross my mind, but I wasn't willing to make any, any predictions until, obviously, Obviously, we knew who, who did it. One other thing i got to remind you guys, and that is, within the last few months, we've had some prosecutors and some you know, public servants um, in Texas who were killed, along with, in one instance, a man and his wife, and it appears that, there, that there, there's a lot of evidence that is tied to some of these you know, Aryan Nation, white nationalist groups. It is the Aryan Nation, nation yeah. Group. Um, and, you know, that seems to just have disappeared. We just seem to stop talking about that. And that is a very, very dangerous situation. In a way, I hate to put it this way, in a way it's more dangerous as a, for our society because if you get to the point where people are afraid to become public servants That's because right. they're, you know, they're intimidated, like in Colombia and some of these other places where the drug cartels pretty much ruled rule the government, I mean, your country falls apart. That's a really yeah. good point. The other thing yeah. about it is that the Aryan nations, that's, I mean, well, Aryan, I guess, is from Germany, but but the heart of the, the white power movement, that's as American as, I don't want to say apple pie, but it is, it, I mean, this is homegrown. It, the, yeah. the nice thing about the Chechen controversy is it is far away from us. It rarely affects us. If anything, the these two boys were deluded because they had really no legitimate complaint against the United States. I guess they could complain the United States didn't help Chechnya in its war against Russia, but you could say that against real any country on earth. Their complaint was their beef was with was this Moscow. So this actually was a weird mixture where they got confused or whatever. But you know, Aryan nations and Ku Klux Klan and white supremacy that that's as old as the United States of America. Yeah, and in that not, respect, it, you're right, Carl, is more dangerous. Let's not forget Timothy McVeigh. I yeah, mean, you know, right. that is right-wing America. The, the Aryan Nation is a real group in the United States that has at least 4,000 members. They've just simply pledged to kill anybody they want, and that's all there is to it. And they are now going after legislators, et cetera, and judges. And um, it's a very frightening situation. Which, well, you know what, guys? We forgot one other thing. On the date of the, um, of the, of, of the uh, incident, there was a Saudi man who was running from the incident, and some American, white guy, dived on the guy and held him down um, until police could get there, and apparently some other people held, helped him. Now, the fact of the matter was this. A bomb went off, and the man was running. It would have, in fact, been suspicious if he weren't running. But just because he was Middle Eastern and he was running, uh, at the same time that everybody else was running for their lives, they dived on this guy, they took him in, they questioned him, they raided his apartment, all of this, just because a man was running from a bombing. In fact, interestingly, the FBI, one of the reasons they could target the Tsarnaev brothers was precisely because they weren't running. What's fascinating is that they look at the yeah. video, the experts, not the people who, who, like Garland said, just grabbed somebody, but the experts, the people in the FBI, looked at the video and they said, now these two guys seem calm. These two guys do not seem surprised. They are not running. That's suspicious. And yeah, one of the reasons right. why they could capture these two was because they were suspiciously not running away from a bombing. 
Um, and and I should also point out, by the way, many people ran toward the bombing yeah, to help. Yeah, there was great heroism. To, there really was. Uh, there uh, ordinary people tying tourniquets. Uh, one person put out a fire that was on somebody else with his hands. Literally could not stop. Had nothing to you know to squelch the fire with, and so uh, uh, literally put out a fire with his hands. So there was lots of heroism there. Uh, before we get off this, though, I know that uh, Terry, you want to talk about the Miranda rights and yeah, red. I really do because I don't. I don't know about you guys, you know, but I was not particularly aware of this exception. The public could safety be exception to the I'm Miranda sorry? rule. The public safety exception to the Miranda rule. Yeah, the rule, public. Yeah, and I want to know how, in heaven's name, it is constitutional. I can see justification for it, but justifying things is a dangerous path. And um, who is it that actually gives the authority? Do the police departments have the authority to do this? Does it have to come from the Justice so, Department? So here's how it works. Here's how it works. The public yeah, safety please. exception uh, was uh, put in by the United States Supreme Court sometime in the 1980s. I'm not sure of the exact date. Um, it actually makes sense to me because uh, let me be clear about the limited nature of the exception. What, what this does is, first of all, you have to understand what Miranda is. Miranda does not say that if you're not giving your Miranda rights, you had to let the guy go. That's not what it says. If people think that's what it says, they've been watching too many movies. Miranda simply reminds someone of their already existing constitutional right to remain silent. And even in the public safety exception, uh, someone could say, I choose to remain silent, and there's nothing they can do about it. You retain your constitutional rights. But the point is about Miranda is if you're interviewed, and you give self-incriminating information. In other words, you incriminate yourself, uh, which you're not, you know, you can't be forced to do under the Fifth Amendment. Then they cannot use that information against you. They, that is still true with the public safety exception. The idea was that Johar Sarnayev has so much evidence against him. They have video of him dropping the bomb and so forth. They have so much evidence against him that anything he says to incriminate himself is irrelevant. Frankly, he already incriminated himself when he told the guy in, in the carjacking that, uh, he, that they were the bombers. So they have so much evidence against him that they don't need to read a Miranda because anything they interrogate will not be used against him in a court of law. They've already got enough. And instead, they're going to use that information to find out how he was radicalized, are there other bombers in the United States, and so forth. So as long as the information is not used against him in a court of law and is simply used to help protect others, I have no problem with the public safety exception. But how do you get, how do you get past that? I mean, again, in the case of the uh, Central Park Five, these teenage boys you know, you know, were, were kept in isolation and interviewed, har- harassed. For thirty hours, right? What happens and every in those one cases, of them that's breaks a because there's a very yeah. simple technique that is used. You know, blame saying the well, your buddy said you raped her. Right. You know. Right. No, and you go thing, on and on. Right. So how can you? you that, know, that's it, different. It, it, it opens this door to abuse of power. Who is overseeing it? Who is making the judgment that you can say, "Fine, we can do whatever we want. We can keep the guy as long as we want. We can interview him and or harass him or torture him, whatever, as long as we want." Who is overseeing this, well, it, this it, exception? It, 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 it's a court. Yeah, and I think um, the other the thing, bro, in, in, a, in a broad sense, what we're looking at here is two competing visions of America. One vision is um, rule of law, and that is, look, this is the law, and this is regardless of what the person is suspected of, regardless of who the suspect is, these are the rights that everybody gets, rule of law. And the fact of the matter is people on the left tend to believe in rule of law. People on the right tend to believe in arbitrary application of law. Yep. Well, we'll give everyone the right. But wait a minute, this guy did, is, is accused of doing something bad. If you talk to some people, and I've heard people say, we should just go ahead and torture the guy. Well, well, well why do they even have to have a trial? What they're now saying is, I don't believe in rule of law. I believe right. in arbitrary application. If you notice, there are some right wingers starting to say we should try this guy as an enemy combatant. Yeah, Why? that was because crazy. They do not want to see the rule of law because they don't really believe in the rule of law under a democratic system. They want things to be done arbitrarily, and whether it's in, in, in any any law. And I think we have to be careful as a society when you start moving from a rule of law. To arbitrary application of law, you're also ru- you're also moving from universal rights to a hierarchical system of rights, which is also Amen. very Th- right. There's some good points, Garland. There, I, and I thought when I read that they wanted to try as enemy combatants, I thought that was absolutely ridiculous. These were Americans. These were one was a citizen, one was had a, gr- a permanent green card. They 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 did a crime on American soil. They were captured by American police. 
Uh, first of all, I don't believe enemy combatant exists. I flipped through my constitution, and there, there's right. no there's no mention of enemy combatant anywhere in there. This is just something made up by the Bush administration. But you're absolutely right. The, the people who want that designation, frankly, do not believe in our constitution. They do not believe in America. They do not believe in our system of laws. I got to tell you something. I have no doubt, zero doubt, that a jury in Massachusetts when seeing all the evidence that they say is out there, and if it's not out there, then, then they should be acquitted. But the evidence that they say is out there, where they're showing them planting the bomb and, and the whole thing, that when they see that evidence, these, that uh, Johar Tsarnaev will be convicted and sent to jail for the rest of his life. I, I have no doubt about that. But it's interesting, the right-wingers don't trust the American system. They don't trust a jury of 12 ordinary individuals, and that's why they want to go around American law. I, I have more faith in the American system th- than they do. But who puts any limits right. on this? That's what I want. Okay, to well, let me put- answer your first question, Terry, because I think the, the, the public safety exception to Miranda ruling uh, is very, very different from what they did to the Central Park Five. What they did to the Central Park Five is they read them their Miranda rights, and then they basically coerced these, these scared— No, they didn't read them their Miranda rights until they videotaped their confessions. That was 30 hours later. Well, then I don't understand why it wasn't thrown out, the interrogation. Uh, under uh, under the law, because everybody I, wanted to hang him. No, no, no. But I, there, there must have been a court decision, and I haven't read it, so I admit that. Where if they were not, if they were interrogated without reading their Miranda rights, there are certain exceptions under the law uh, that I think are too freely applied. They they basically you can waive your your rights. Uh, that I think they too easily claim a waiver or too easily claim a voluntary discussion. Um, and I don't know, I, I have to admit, I don't know the None of them that were taken the in five. were aware of the fact that they were suspected of being the rapist. Well, that's... Um, they didn't even know what they were being accused of. My point is this. I'm not going to defend what happened in Central Park 5. I cannot defend it, and I would not defend it if I could. But the point is, Mark, any but, power can be misused. How is this be. power not going to be misused? In this particular case, I'm actually okay with the public safety exception because nothing that, that Joe Hart Sarnayev says from now, from the moment he gets out of the hospital or feels well enough to talk to the FBI... From now on, none of it will be used against him in a court of law because he hasn't been read his Miranda rights. But and I'm okay with that for two reasons. One, they have more than enough evidence to convict him. No matter what he says now, it doesn't matter. But it, that's it, in retrospect. Well, no, but that's the point. They're declaring the public safety exception now. Yeah, but right. he hasn't been interviewed yet. Right, but my. But point I would, is, I would make, I would make the argument that what we are calling a public safety exception really doesn't exist for this reason. There's no difference. Between a, public, between a case with a public safety exception and without a public safety exception. In either case, if you interview a person without reading their Miranda rights, you cannot use any of the evidence obtained within that interview for, uh, for That's prosecution correct. in court. That's correct. Be entered. In either case. That's so correct. The fact of the matter is this. It's not really an exception. It's, an, it's, it's a, a choice, choice a not choice to use. That's right. Of That's the right. prosecutors and interrogators to say, we feel that we've already got enough evidence, so what the heck? We, we don't care if you can't use it in... in so really, well, then why would, if you've got the, enough evidence... Is there is no public safety... That, that's a good that's, point, Garland. That's normal procedure. That's a good point. What they're basically saying is we don't need to Mirandaize him because we don't need anything he says. We're actually right. not using what he says against him. We're using what he says in order to find out if there's you know a terrorist training camp in Russia, it, it, where his brother went, how his brother was radicalized. Isn't that a scary, isn't that a scary assumption, though? No, Isn't because that I want assumption? to learn how the brother was radicalized because there may be more uh, Americans. So what? So now we can torture him? N- no, so that we can find out if someone else is being radicalized. I want to yeah, find out. Yeah, but that opens the door. What, you know, if they've got enough evidence to try him, fine, he is tried. Right. If, you want, if they want to question him, question him. That's fine. Have a lawyer present. You know, but, no, but I mean, it I, makes no sense whatsoever to, to question somebody about something we don't know about, which is what we're doing, trying to create something we do know about. Well, and that's the, the where fact abuse and harassment and torture is, comes in. The fact you of the can matter get anybody is to we're admit talking anything. About, we're talking about something as a former law enforcement officer. There is no difference between a public safety, uh, uh, an, an incident or a case with a public safety exception or without one. There's absolutely no difference. Uh, you know, we're talking about something that doesn't exist. On oh, wait, any is the lawyer gonna given be president? investigation, president? the law enforcement uh, personnel could, deter- could decide, you know what, 
any investigation, forget even talking about it. They could decide, you know, we've got videotape of the crime. Let's try to find out if there's somebody else involved and not Mirandize the guy, knowing that they can't use it. But they say, well, we don't care if we can't use it. We already got it. So in every case in America where someone is uh, accused of a crime, the so-called public, ex- public exception uh, uh, safety, I mean public, uh, public safety exception, exists. It doesn't are you exist. telling me? Are you telling me, God, Are you state. telling me? Are you telling me that anybody can be arrested and anybody can be questioned ad infinitum if they don't accuse them of a crime, basically, and um, you know aren't going to plan to take it to court? But they can just arrest you or me and keep me in jail forever and harass me, torture me, well, whatever. Well, they, they can't keep you in jail forever because you can you have the right of the issue of, being, of the issue of whether or not they can detain you and both and what grounds under which they contain you is a separate issue right. issue right. from what they can what they can use as evidence after they question you whether or not you're Mirandized. Two you total, total remember, different issues. I mean, you guys are young, but do you remember during the 60s when they arrested everybody in Washington D.C. You know, during the, the riots and put them in RFK Stadium and kept them there for three days? I don't remember that, but I remember right in New York. I forget which convention it was. I think it was 2004 or something when they they, they arrested a bunch of protesters oh, yeah. and kept them in jail for yeah, two I, days. That's in my life memory, and that was like yeah, 10 I years ago. I was there. Ago. I was there. Were, yep. you, were you arrested there too? No, I was on the air at the time, but <laughs> oh, our staff okay. with um, WPFW, no, some our staff yeah. members were arrested. So you don't have to look back to the 60s to find evidence of that. And it, I just want to be very clear. I am not in any way justifying any of those attentions or Central Park Five to say that, as Garland is saying, it's, it's, it's fair and okay with me as long as they don't use the information against the accused. That's the only constitutional they right they have, the right against self-incrimination. As long as they don't use the evidence against the accused, I'm actually fine with questioning to find out are there other people involved in a conspiracy? Are there other dangers out there? As long as the evidence is not used against them, if, if there are other, uh, you know, Chechen or Dagestani or Al Qaeda terrorists in the United States who are who are, you know, influencing American youth to to go out and commit you've terrorist heard, you've acts, you've heard of plea bargaining. I want right? to know about it. You've heard of yeah, plea I, bargaining. I, I agree with you, Mark. I don't, I don't I don't have a problem with it as long as they go by. You know, since it's not going to be used, um, it would be no different than you saying, well, the, to the cops, you can't open that glove box, and they open it, and they find something. Right. But they already know when they open it, they can't use it as evidence. They so can't use it against me. It. They can use it against can somebody ask, else. Can I ask you guys one question? But not me. Can I ask you guys one question? Yeah. Yeah, and then have we got to go to the brothers. Have you ever been arrested and put in jail? I have not. Garland? Have you been uh, arrested I've and put been in detained jail? by the police, but never arrested. Well... But until you experience it, until you experience the power they have over you, I don't accept this argument. I mean, when you've been in jail, and I have been in jail, when you've been arrested, you are basically powerless, and they make sure you know you are powerless, and they're going to do any damn thing they want with you. And the only thing that we have that does protect an individual are the simple little laws that we are right now saying, well, they don't really matter. But well, we got to talk about this is not right? about being in court. This is about being in jail. Okay. And there's I, a big difference. Garland's right, and he has the right to talk about his topic, the Koch brothers. I'm going to take a real quick break, and then we're going to set up and give a chance to Garland tell us what the Koch brothers are doing. Good you evening. want to dial in 202 889 9797. 202 889 9797. This is Mark Levine, Garland Nixon, Terry D. Kester back with the Rockets Caucus right after this. You're listening to WPWC, We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Does your child have difficulty controlling their anger or a history of academic failure in school? Options Public Charter School offers a therapeutic learning environment with small classroom sizes and on-site counseling services to help students succeed. Options PCS is now enrolling grades 5 through 11 for the upcoming school year. For more information, call Options PCS today at 202-547-1028. Options Public Charter School, exceptional education for exceptional students. You're listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Welcome back to the Rockies Caucus. This is Mark Levine, and we've got Terry D. Kester. And 
Garland Nixon. And they're on the line, and we're going to change the topic a bit because Garland wants to tell us about something the Koch brothers are up to. For those of you who don't know, the Koch brothers are, I think, the third and fourth richest billionaires in the United States of America. They own an oil empire, and they fund a lot of right-wing causes. What are they up to now, Garland? Coke Industries, the sprawling private company of which Charles Koch serves as chairman and chief executive, is exploring a bid to buy the Tribune Company's eight regional newspapers, including the Los Angeles Times, Chicago Ooh. Tribune, Baltimore Sun, Orlando Sentinel, and the Hartford Courant. Um, Los Angeles uh, Times is the fourth largest newspaper um, in the um, in the uh, country, the Tribune is number nine. They would have the two largest newspapers in Florida, uh, Orlando Sentinel and, and uh, the Sun Sentinel in Fort Lauderdale. And they would also have Hoy, which is the, the largest Spanish-language newspaper. Um, uh, apparently, scary. they had a, um, a conference. And in the conference, one of the things they said a couple of things. One is, how do we make sure our voice is being heard? And the other, they was uh, a person from the um, that was at the conference said they see the conservative voice as not being well represented. <laughs> so apparently, the Koch brothers feel that the the top one tenth of one tenth of one percent is they are not having their voice heard, and the only way they can be fair and balanced is to buy all of the major newspapers in our country and once and for all change the landscape to a laissez-faire uh, 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 um, uh, a government where, as I always say, corporations want less government for the same reason that burglars want less police. That is really scary. I used to live in Los Angeles, and the L.A. Times... Uh Currently is and certainly was a very good newspaper. I mean, I, I knew when I think of the best newspapers in the country, I'd probably say New York Times first, Washington Post second. Uh, but the L.A. Times is up there. I'd say in the top five. And and to take down this wonderful newspaper, which really is kind of the newspaper of the whole Pacific time zone. I mean, everyone reads the L.A. Times. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. You're in Oregon. Do people read the L.A. Times over there? Oh, we read them all. We should read them all, too. And um, as anywhere else, frankly, uh, the whole thing is going much more conservative than you can possibly imagine. And you guys, you know, you should remember or be aware, and you probably are, the Koch brothers already are a huge contributor to PBS, public broadcasting. Really? I didn't know that. Yes. And for instance, the most obvious one where they're the very first one listed is they now control or contribute to support um, Nova, the supposed science show. So guess what? You don't have any discussions anymore on Nova about global warming, about pollution, about oil spills, or anything like that. All nice and cokey. That's well, the, keep in mind scary. something, too. The Koch brothers are kind of more libertarian than they are conservative. So they, like, for instance, so I know at least one of them favors gay marriage. Um, so to some extent, they're not the pure social conservative. So it makes sense that some of the things that we on the left support, there's always an intersection between libertarians and, 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 and people, left progressives, whatever. So there, there, you shouldn't be surprised. Now, if it was a, a right-wing conservative, I'd be shocked. But with libertarians, there's a little bit more wiggle room between progressives and libertarians. True, but when it comes In to some issues... Areas, like like the environment. I mean, that's something where the liberals and libertarians strongly disagree. Uh, the Koch brothers make money by polluting our environment. They make yep. money by by throwing up masses of carbon in the air, which causes global warming. They, they the more they dirty up our air and water, the richer they get and the poorer we get. And so, if Nova and I didn't know this, uh, Terry, and I'm really glad that you shared it with us. If they're buying up the Science Channel, when you know global warming is accepted by 99.9% of scientists uh, that are not uh, being funded by the industry, uh, then we're not going to get the stories on the Arctic ice cap uh, breaking up or uh, polar bears losing their habitat or the rising oceans or the increased weather patterns, all of which are damaging the entire world and all of which are attributed largely to the things that make the Koch brothers rich. That's and very I, think it's, I think it's important to also to look at this from the perspective of who they are. When they say, how do we make sure our voice is being heard, um, they're not talking about politics. They're talking about class. When they say our, they're not talking about all the Tea Party members. 
who they do their best they can they can to fund fund them and manipulate them. They're talking about the super super billionaires. I don't think this is really about politics. It, it, it appears to be about politics. I think it's really about money, and it's about the it's about class, and it's about ensuring that this super super top one percent that they're you know the tiny fraction of of one percent that they're in. There, there's a few crumbs left. Terry, there's a few crumbs left of the pie, and they want those, darn it, they want those last few crumbs. Well, they do, but it is political because, I mean, money is politics and the media is politics. I mean, you got Clear Channel, you got uh, Bonneville Productions, which is, you know, strictly Mormon owned, and uh, you've got Koch brothers buying into it. You've got Murdoch. I mean, there's not going to be any independent newspaper. They are, are the largest contributors to the Americans for Prosperity, which is the uh, political action group that galvanized the Tea Party. And uh, they also, in case you guys didn't know it, they are the main pushers for the Keystone Pipeline. Why do they want the Keystone? Own pipeline with all this <laughs> dirty crude oil is because it's supposed to go right down to their refinery in Texas. It's their refinery that will be fed the oil. These guys are truly dangerous people. And part of it is you have to remember how limited our First Amendment protections are. I mean, the First Amendment gives the right of everybody to, to talk and say something, but if you don't control the newspapers, you don't have the media. I mean, all of our major channels are owned by corporations anyway. Right. Yep. I forget GE owns one and Comcast owns another. And uh, even the basic CBC, CBS, ABC and NBC are, are all controlled by corporate. And then you get to the Murdoch Empire, the Wall Street Journal uh, now owned by them, uh, Fox News, uh, and not to mention talk radio, where we are definitely a rare breed. I mean, yeah. it's, it's crazy that in Washington, D.C., a city, the District of Columbia voted more than 90 percent for for President Obama. I think it was 92 or 93 percent. They voted more than 90 percent for John Kerry against George W. Bush. And yet they're basically we act radio is the only commercial non-conservative talk radio station in this whole area. Uh, that's crazy. Uh, Baltimore, very liberal city, very blue state, and uh, Maryland is liberal. Maryland's liberal, and yet Maryland has right wing talk shows far, far more than the left. And that's not because of the people of Maryland. That's because of the money. And what the Koch brothers are showing is it doesn't matter what the people believe. It doesn't matter. I mean, it, in, in blue Maryland and blue District of Columbia, there is still more right-wing talk radio, far more than people like us. And now the Koch brothers want to tilt the, the, the more. How, I don't know how you tilt it anymore. I mean, they can squelch well, our voices. Well, I tell you voices. how you tilt it anymore. The Koch brothers are furious that Obama won this election. That's true. Second time, That's they it. are furious yeah. about that, and they're going to do anything that they can to get recon to get control of the media to make sure that they put millions of dollars into the election anyway, and they lost. True, they're pissed, and they want to make sure that doesn't happen again. And the other thing is, these people can read the future. They know that they have the the, the bully pulpit in the in, in the media, and they know they have the big megaphone. But what they also see is that when you look at the young people in this country, the young people are. Um, overwhelmingly, in overwhelming percentages, rejecting their antiquated social views on, you know, on gay marriage and race and and all the other things that traditionally the Republicans have have, have pushed, you know, pushed the gender roles, et cetera. Um, so I think they see that the demographics are changing, and that all demographics, regardless of the demographics, in the younger generation is is moving away from what they what they believe and i think it's it's going to be this is you know there's some final attempts here to grab it all um and to grab control of uh the entire media so they can prevent the inevitable and garland i think it was you that mentioned maybe but terry that they're buying the the largest spanish newspaper is that right the largest because uh, it says a deal could include hoy the second largest second spanish largest. language newspaper which speaks to the pivotal Hispanic demographic. Well, I mean, let's face it. I mean, the Republicans learned, uh-oh, Latino votes count when they lost the, the most recent election. And so they're, in fact, oh, I don't even know if they'll go that far on immigration, but at least they're putting an effort out where they never did before to reach out to what is, after all, today, America's largest minority. Sorry, African Americans, uh, you're third now. You're uh, after whites. Uh, it's, uh, Latinos are, about, are more than blacks in America, and they are increasingly voting. And this whole demographic is strongly democratic and, and also also they are scared to death that the poor people of the country might be able to keep medicare they might be able to keep yep. social security yep. those people of course are entitled those who at the very top who have billions of dollars are not entitled they feel left out 
So they have to strike back. Somebody made the quote that um, if uh, the Koch brothers uh, got some bad press that Darth Vader is buying the tribute, they really don't care anyway. And it's interesting the things they say. They see the conservative voice as not being well represented. I mean, you know, the thing about it is, Mark, they've only got 95% of the the talk radio shows in America. I mean, they only got 95%, Mark. I mean, certainly they need more than that. You need at least 96% before you can consider that your voice is well heard. So, so Garland, is there anything we can do to stop it? Can the part of justice say that they're getting a monopoly? I mean, uh, Rupert Murdoch, at least, he owns so much. I have forget 35 percent of all american media well, some crazy number a clear channel it, it, we could stop them but the Koch brothers this is kind of their first foray into media is there any hope of stopping this no i don't think so and and, and this is what's happening in america you know i've been saying for years eventually in the entire world there'll be one corporation and that corporation and the government will be all one i, I mean look at the banks i remember when there were all these banks and now they're like what three banks you know they all own all of the banks what you're seeing, and you, you look at Walmart, what are they doing? They're wiping out all the small businesses, and eventually the only thing place you're going to be able to buy anything is Walmart. And then that's when they'll triple the prices on it. But we're seeing that in every area of America where, you know, that's kind of, it, it, you almost feel like that's where capitalism in, inevitably go, grows, goes, where you get one giant in every area that sucks up everybody else and takes over. And I think the media is moving in the same direction as Walmart and the banks, et cetera. Yeah, and we got to check something which you don't probably don't even have time to check today. But I guarantee you, the Koch brothers are on boards of all kinds of major industries and corporations in America, and therefore have all that influence too. Well, I began the show on an optimistic note, talking about how the sun was shining and the terrorists were captured, and y'all have really brought me down. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, you, Mark. You, you we love totally you. Totally ruined my day. I'm gonna go <laughs> out. I mean, I see this beautiful sun. I'm, I'm gonna walk outside, and one of those clouds is gonna follow me like like bad luck schlep rock. <laughs> Uh, but uh, so we're all doomed. The Coke Brothers are going to own us all. Have a good day, everybody. Have a good Sunday. <laughs> Thank you for for I'm joining the Rockus that, Caucus. Mark. That's okay. Hey, folks, where can they find you if 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 you're hiding under a rock? Uh, Garland, let me start with you. Uh, yeah, uh, Twitter at Garland Nixon, G A R L A N D N I X O N. They can Facebook me Garland Nixon or Garland N, the, my uh, na- first name and the first letter of my last name. Garland N at Gmail dot com. Gotcha, and Terry. And- uh, just one word, uh, one letter, doctor of democracy at AOL.com. That's D-R, right, of democracy? Yes, yes, yes. Not, yes, not thank spelled you. out uh, the word. Yeah. Fair yeah. enough. And uh, you can find me, of course, at uh, MarkLevingTalk.com. There's a Mark Levine fan page. And follow me on Twitter at Mark Levine Talk. And coming up, we're going to devote the next two hours to what went on in Boston, but also went on, went on in Texas. Ricin, terrorist attacks, what causes a terrorist, what can we do to stop it, and when are we ever going to stop tarring a whole group of people for the actions of just a few? Lots coming up on the Inside Scoop. I want to thank both Garland and Terry for joining me on the Rockus Caucus. You can hear the Rockus Caucus on We Act Radio every Sunday at noon. Please tune in next week. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mark. Have a happy day. Thank you. All right, coming up is the Inside Scoop right after this. listening to WPWC We Act Radio 1480 AM weactradio.com <laughs>